This is live for you. Um, it's very different to be teaching and there's no audience here, but uh, we want to welcome everybody that's been able to tune in and uh, we welcome you to our study, A Kingdom of Priests. And we're going to do a quick review of chapter one, chapter two, and then we will start with chapter three. Um, but previously we've already covered the first two chapters. This is just to bring you up to date with where we are. We do want to have a word of prayer before we begin our study, and I'll ask Pastor J.D. Hudson to pray. Thank you for joining us this evening, and I know we're in some trying times, but praise the Lord, we serve a triumphant God that is still triumphant even in our trying times. And so I'd like for us to just bow our heads and pray for a special anointing upon Sister Ellen as she brings this lesson, and uh, upon our nation and our governmental leaders, that God will give them wisdom, and that through this, uh, many people's hearts will be turned toward the Lord. So let's pray. Father, God, I'm so grateful for your blessings, your love and mercy. Lord, without you, we are nothing. And God, what we want to do at Garner Church of God is do everything we can within the, the, the touch of our hands and our power to get the gospel out, even over the airways, Lord, whether it's Facebook or YouTube or BoxCast, because we want people to know the Word of God, to have strength and power and anointing from the, the, the Word and, and the strength that comes from knowing that Word. So, Lord, I pray for a special anointing and grace upon Sister Ellen as she brings this Bible study that hearts are going to be changed. Lord, touch our uh, governmental leaders, both stateside Lord, worldwide, our, our president who is trying to help us navigate this very difficult day. Lord, I know your anointing is upon us. And Lord, no greater time than this than to see your Holy Spirit work through your church to minister to a hurting world. In Jesus' name, amen. Sister Ellen. And one thing, Pastor, we normally take up the offering at this time. So how can we give? Okay, thanks for asking. Yes, so we're working on um, actually a instructional video on how to download the, uh, the Garner Church of God app. We have created an app, but uh, until we get that uh, out there available for you, um, you can go to www.garnerchurchofgod.org. And we will actually have uh, an option there for you to click. Uh, I think it says donate. And if you want to click on that, it'll take you straight to our donate page. And you can give there uh, at the GarnerChurchOfGod.org website. Uh, we will be coming later again with an instructional video on how to download uh, the Garner Church of God app, which is very easy to use. On that app, uh, there's a, a giving button. There's a, a media button where you will be able to, with just a simple few clicks, be able to get to our sermons and our Bible studies. There is uh, also a Bible there available and a calendar of events on that app. But anyway, just wanted to share that with you. If you'll turn your attention to Sister Ellen as she brings the Word of God. Brother Doug Small is the one that wrote this material that we're studying from, so we're going to start out on the threshold of revival, and the title of the study is A Kingdom of Priests. Uh, we take our scripture from Exodus, the 19th chapter, verses 5 and 6. If you obey my voice and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure, a kingdom of priests, and a holy nation. So when Jesus came, he came quoting Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2. Jesus begins a new priestly movement. He says in verse 1, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. So he called 12 disciples and he sent them out with the power of the priesthood. They were intermediaries. They healed the sick, cast out devils, did mighty works, and they preached the gospel of the kingdom. And so when Peter wrote his first epistle, he referenced the concept that the church was to be a kingdom of priests. In, Rome, in Revelation 1 and 6, it says, Says, he has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father. 
So in 1 Peter 2 and 5, ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 2 and 9 says, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And so the anointing ceremony for the believer priest on Pentecost, the day of Pentecost, was the anointing ceremony for this kingdom of priests that he's talking about. So the fullness of the Spirit is an empowerment for service in the kingdom of God. So there's a job to do. We are, the, during the fullness of the Spirit, there is empowerment for service. Um, in the Middle Ages, the church lost touch with the call to be a movement of believer priest. And again, God's people backed down the mountain, allowing a whole new breed of priest to form a layer between them and God. God had wanted to meet with the Israelites, and they became fearful, and they turned and came back down the mountain. And so the result of this detachment of the common man from God, and therefore his responsibility to the world, would be the corrupt period we commonly call the dark ages. So now we stand on the precipice of eternity. God is speaking what he did 35 years at 3,500 years ago at Sinai. He's calling a generation to climb the mountain. He's calling us to have a personal encounter with him, to know him as it were face to face or intimately. And uh, the little insert there says, I am determined to know Jesus. I'm determined not to let anything of man separate me from the fullness of Jesus Christ. I'm determined to know his voice, his forgiveness, his friendship, his gentleness, his guidance, his promises, his presence, his protection, his provision, his abundance, his healing touch, his hope for man, his faith in me, and his power working in the earth, and his victory in my life. I am determined to know Jesus, and only in knowing him will Will we be transformed and only by being transformed can we then communicate a transforming gospel amen so what we preach is not merely ideological material it is life itself to preach it antiseptically without having oneself wrapped up in it misses the point of the gospel it is about being not about doing it is about transformation not merely proclamation and so then we went into chapter 2, discerning the difference between a relationship and experience. Again, looking at Exodus, the 19th chapter being our uh, formation there, the thing that we're putting this together on, our foundation. So again, a kingdom of priests, a scriptural perspective on balance. So if we look at Exodus 19, the passage that we quoted earlier, we recall that Israel stood at the base of the mountain called Sinai. They'd been invited out to meet with God actually to meet God, to hear his voice, to become personally acquainted with him so they could be a nation of priests. And that was all about relationship. And during the 40 years in the wilderness, Israel would come to know the miraculous. Miracles would be common to them. The Exodus generation, a journey decorated with the supernatural. That generation had seen the plagues come upon Egypt miraculously. And every one of them came as Moses had predicted and declared to Pharaoh. They had seen the Red Sea part. They lived from a shower of daily manna. And on one occasion they would receive a miraculous bounty of quail meat. They would witness a river of water Water coming from a rock in the middle of a desert. They had a cloud by day for shade and a pillar of fire by night for warmth. Their clothes had a miraculous durability. They didn't wear out. Their health 
at a miraculous level. Remembering the pillar, pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. And so what is incredible here, getting lost on the way to maturity, thinking about this balance. So what's incredible is that in the face of these daily miracles, these supernatural experiences that come with such regularity, there was bickering, backbiting, critical attitudes, division, doubt, fear, faithlessness, murmuring, slandering, rebellion, resistance to and resentment of authority. So we see here in the middle of the supernatural, we see them at their worst. Doubt, fear, murmuring, and the like. Open talk of defection. They were aborted and unapproved attempts at entrance into the land. There were major relational splits among key leaders. There were quarrels with Moses by members of his own family. So how could Israel have the miraculous and still be so immature? How could they see the spectacle of God's power of his mighty hand and still be so petty? Don't miss the point here saying no to relational obligations. Don't miss the point. Israel had experiences with God, miraculous and sensational adventures. But what did God want? He wanted a relationship with them and they with him. And as Pastor Hudson had pointed out, relationship and experience are not the same. Israel had come to the base of the mountain. They had seen the awesomeness of God's glory on the mountain. They were on the edge of a disclosure of God to their whole nation. But instead of consummating a relationship with God, going on further up the mountain that would have made them a nation of priests, they turned and they went back down the mountain. Instead of exposing themselves to his presence in what would have been a transforming encounter, they caved in to comfortable. They caved in to the less demanding status. Rather than coming close to him and to his awesome holiness in a way that would have introduced them to a level of vigilant wonder and reverence, they opted for a more casual and distant status. What did they do? They said no to God's invitation for responsible intimacy. You see, as you develop intimacy with God, the supernatural becomes natural. And here they opted for the casual and the distant status. Where did it leave them? Bickering, backbiting. They rejected the relationally rooted obligation of standing between God and others for the purpose of witness and declaration. They declined an ongoing exposure to his holiness that would have constantly ordered their lives in the direction of deeper depths and a heightened sense of integrity. Uh, embraced by holiness, the path to God's daily presence. But God had wanted to increase his blessing on them. He did not want his blessings to be terminal, to stop with them or in them or among them. He wanted to pour his blessings into them and therefore through them to the nations. Israel, by his plan, would become transmitters of the blessings, the glory, the face, the power, and the love of God. But in order to represent him, they had to know him. In order to represent Christ, we must know him. Knowing about him is not knowing him. And so we need to really remember this from chapter 2. This was the big takeaway, that he wants to pour his blessings in us and through us to bless others. We are to be his transmitters of this blessing, this glory, this love and power of God. But first, we must know him. 
and then detaching experience from relationship. At Sinai, Israel isolated experience from relationship with responsibility. And as a result, they were exposed to the miraculous. They were never transformed by these experiences. Increasingly, their miracles were only aimed at their own needs. They were consumed with self. Isaiah 29 and 13, and so the Lord says, these people say they are mine. They honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me, and their worship of me is nothing but man-made rules learned by rote. So they were consumed with self. They turned the miraculous into self-serving supernatural transactions. Water for their thirst, food for their bodies, shade from the sun's heat, warmth in the cold night, health and provision for them. We see in the cloud the glory of God. They saw shelter from the sun. Despite all the miracles, they remain, remained immature. What do we see? We see in the cloud the glory of God. But what did they see? They saw something for self. There's a lesson there. We need to be careful at what we're seeing. Do we just want an experience? Do we just want to get the tingles? Do we just want to get the, the cold uh, goosebumps? Or do we want a mighty move of God? Because we have moved into that place of relationship with him and his power exudes and we begin to feel the glory. And so we have the strength then to move on further up the mountain rather than turning back. I put here a personal an analogy here. Uh, observe this picture. And I say here that this, when I talk about experience and I talk about what God is doing, this is a profound picture. It moves me in deep ways. Uh, we call it him Pastor Pa. Pastor Pa Hudson, you can uh, see up in the top there, he's preaching, and there were people that had gathered at the altar, and this little girl had gone down to the altar with her mother, and I asked her mother for permission to use this picture. What a picture of climbing up the mountain. And this is what he's calling us to. He wants that relationship with us, not just an experience where he delivers a microwave request to us through the drive through window, but we have come to worship him, to bow down before him. And this little girl was uh, mimicking what she saw her mother do. This should move us and make us realize how God wants us to come to him as a little child. He's waiting for relationship. Don't turn and go back down the mountain. In conclusion of chapter 2, we see the real power is not in experience isolated from relationship. It is in relationship, rich with experiences with God, but not consumed by the need for ever new, higher, and grandiose experiences of this kind or that. We need to understand that we can't come and expect a brand new word. We can learn from the word, and he'll give us new revelation, but we're not going to get another book to the Bible. We're not going to get some other great and grandiose thing to make us feel good just over and over again, enough to cause us to be satisfied to see it right where we find ourselves. But God will move in us and through us through his Holy Spirit if we have a hungry heart and we go before him and we ask him for that relationship. Uh, John Piper was quoted as saying, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. I am satisfied with Jesus. I am his and he is mine. That's the takeaway that we can get from chapters 1 and 2. And tonight we start now with chapter 3, eight days to Pentecost. And it is uh, extremely rich material here. I'm sure it's going to take uh, a couple of Wednesday nights for us to uh, 
cover all of this, possibly even three, but it is so full of things that can remind us of our walk and our journey with the Lord and where we get our strength. Eight days to Pentecost. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded, because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in his own tongue, wherein we were born? We do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God." And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? What does Pentecost mean? Let's listen closely to the answer that Peter gives us. In Acts 2 and 22, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Him, being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. You killed the miracle worker. The wonders and signs which Jesus did were by the power of God. All of you know that, and you killed him, yet even in that despicable act, you were functioning in the predetermined will of God, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. Acts 2 and 24. He is not dead, he is alive. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. He is greater than David, Peter declares. What you are witnessing, the coming of the Holy Spirit, is proof that Jesus has been raised from the dead and seated by the right hand of God in heaven. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses, Acts 2 and 32. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. The coming of the Spirit is a sign of the acceptance of Jesus in the heavens, his very exaltation and installation as heaven's high priest. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made this same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. And it was hearing this that pricked the heart of the Jerusalem community and brought repentance. Pentecost is tied to the completion, the consummation of the work of Jesus Christ. So let's discover the Old Testament background for all of this. It says, On the first day of the first month shall thou set up the tabernacle of the tent of the congregation. Exodus 40 and 2. Notice it is the first day of the first month of the second year after the Exodus event that the tabernacle of Moses is first set up. And we'll note each piece of furniture as it is installed. And a little side note here, what I want us to understand and realize is that every single piece of furniture in this tabernacle, every covering was ordained by God. It was spoken and it was directed on how to build it. You will see here the coverings of the tabernacle. For instance, instance, the fine twisted linen, the goat's hair, the ram skin dyed red, the badger skin, on and on it was told how it was supposed to be laid out. The divisions of the tabernacle is divided into three sections. We have the outer court, the holy place, and the most holy place. And notice the light 
states in each. Watch this. The outer court only uses natural light. The holy place had the light of the candlesticks, and the most holy place had the light of the glory of God by the presence of God, who is light. The holy place is also called the sanctuary, and the most holy place is popularly called the holy of holies. And bear with me here. I want to read this. Some dwell in the outer court. They don't understand the things of the Spirit. They're often bored with the spiritual. They try to understand spiritual things, but within their natural reasoning and in light of general revelation. And so they are staying here in the outer court. Uh, some have pressed on into God, and they've gone beyond the court, the natural light, and they're understanding at a deeper level of the light of the holy place. They have experienced the light of the Spirit from the lampstand. They've learned to listen to the Holy Spirit and experience the illumination of the Word by the Spirit. Still less have pressed further from the holy place into the most holy place. And in this most holy place, they have had a life-changing encounter with God and the light of His glory. God has spoken with them as He promised He would speak to Moses from off the mercy seat. And so for these believers, there can never be any doubt that God is real. And so again, just to review, there were those who hung in the outer court, just in the natural light, understanding generally. Then there are those that have moved into the holy place and they see the light that's coming from the candlesticks and they've begun to have revelation. And then there are those that have gone into the most holy place. And they're not just satisfied with uh, listening to the Holy Spirit and ex experiencing the illumination of the Word, but they say, I want that, but I want more. And they want to hear God speak. They want God to move in and make a life change in their life and causing them to be truly bearers of His glory. In the outer court, we see the furniture there. Uh, the outer court contained the altar and the laver. The holy place, the candlestick, was in the south. The table of showbread is in the north. And the golden altar of incense is fr in front of the veil to the west. And then we see the most holy place, the ark of the covenant and mercy seat. This is the cover for the ark. And in this, we see all of this furniture, we see four colors are used. Blue representing heaven, purple representing royalty, scarlet representing redemption, and linen representing righteousness. These colors tell the story of redemption. Blue shows the creator God of heaven who became flesh. Purple revealed in time as the king of the Jews. Scarlet was rejected of men. His blood was shed in crucifixion and linen that we might be clothed in his righteousness. And so the tabernacle is a reflection in the natural of spiritual principles. And so it's important for a foundation for us. We see the tabernacle uh, in its natural setting and how God had uh, told Moses to set it up. But there are spiritual principles that we need to take away from this. The tabernacle is God's accommodation to help us understand his revelation. In other words, it is a road map into his presence. So in the tabernacle, there is a picture of Jesus, and we see Jesus, the sacrifice. He is the brazen altar. And then Jesus, the sanctifier, the bronze laver. 
and then the Jesus the light of the world in the golden candlesticks and Jesus the bread of life in the table of showbread and Jesus our intercessor is the golden altar and Jesus the covering of our sins in the mercy seat you see Jesus is the way he is the gate he is the door to the holy place and Jesus is the truth the veil is Jesus the life and so Hebrews tells us that the rent veil is his flesh in Hebrews 10 19 to 21 so we see that only one time a year was the high priest allowed to go into the most holy place the holy of holies and the only way into the most holy place is through the cross event through identification with Jesus' torn flesh and his death on the cross at Calvary then there in the most holy place we experience the power of his resurrection and I trust that all of us have found him to be the way the truth and the life we have found this door and if not I invite you to search him seek him and find him because John 3 16 gives us a way he shows us his great love and he stands ready to take us into the most holy place place. Amen. Let's strive for that. And then we see uh, the ministries of the church even are implications of the tabernacle. We first see the altar. The altar is the ministry of blood sacrifice. It is the place of forgiveness of sin and the consecration of self. And then so there the altar is so critical. Blood sacrifice, the place of forgiveness of sin. And it's where we consecrate ourselves. We say yes Lord we give it all to you and then we see the laver the water and cleansing by the word the lampstand stands for the fruit the oil and fire the ministry of the spirit and then the table of showbread our bread and nourishment and there in the bread the table of showbread um, one of the uh, times the author was teaching it himself he said we should go there and get bread we should stuff bread in every pocket we've got we should take bread as much as we can haul away from there because we need to co take that bread and go out from our own selves not only do we nourish ourselves with it but we go out and we nourish a lost and dying world with the bread that we have taken it is our nourishment fellowship and feeding and so this is the ministry of the word at the father's table um, we get Get our nourishment there and then the golden altar uh, stands for the incense and fire prayer and pure worship this is where we have an opportunity to go to our highest place on that mountain to go in and to worship him with pure worship and pure praise we bring all of the above things with us we've gone by the altar and we've received forgiveness of sin we've gone by the laver and we've cleansed ourselves. We have been changed by the word of God. The spirit is now working in our lives. The table of showbread begins to nourish us and then we begin to worship him because we now have been prepared to look outside of our own selves and to worship the king of kings. Uh, and so we see here how important each piece of this uh, tabernacle furniture was. And then we look at the ark, the manna, the tablets. There's security in relationship and we know just from the days that we're living in now, the security in relationship over and over again as we encounter issues in our life, you will hear true servants of God saying, I put my trust in the Lord. We know that over years of serving him, there's not been one single time that he's failed us. We've never seen his children begging for bread and so we know that he has delivered us over and over and over again and so we have such an assurance within our heart that that peace that passes all understanding
blessing, the joy that we have as we serve the Lord. We feel it tangibly in our lives because then we know that he has got his hand on us. And who are we not to worship him? Who are we not to understand that his blessings are flowing over us and in us? And as they do that and they begin to pour out of us and our cup is full and running over, we will bless others. Take this opportunity to let your full cup run over and bless somebody because of all the things that he's done for us. We can be secure in our relationship with our Father God. And then the mercy seat made of solid gold. It is the place of the glory of God. The direction in scripture is always the ark outward. The most holy place and its furnishings are mentioned first, then the holy place, and then the court. The reason for this, the direction is from the presence of God outward to man. Pure worship begins, it brings to mind John 12 and 3. Remember when Mary took a very costly perfume, she anointed the feet of Jesus and, he, and she wiped his feet with her hair. She broke open that costly perfume and she poured out that perfume on him and then she acted as a servant and began to wipe it off his feet with her hair costly broken the offering is humble it is personal and thank you Jesus it is fragrant we began to worship him and when we bring this kind of worship to him we are climbing up the mountain David said I will not offer to God that which cost me nothing as I give myself as a sacrificial offering of worship like incense My praise and prayer becomes a sweet fragrance at the throne of God. Praise and worshipful attitudes transform environments. And so I can tell you today that if we get into the presence of God and we begin to offer that which cost us something, which cost us to go out of our way for our fellow man. I had someone today send me a note and, um, you know, he hasn't been knowing us very long, but he reached out to me and my husband and he said, do you know, do you need anything? Uh, do you need a Walmart run? Do you need anything at all? I assured him that at this point we were okay. And he sent a note back and said, you need anything, you let me know. This is a picture of us going out and being the hands and the feet of Christ. And I tell you, when we are climbing up the mountain and we're offering this kind of worship and praise up to the Father, instead of always saying, gimme, Mick, gimme, we are in turn giving to him. God honors that and he will bring us victory and he will bring joy to our hearts that we have never known. God wants us to know him. It is as if he has left a trail into his presence in the furnishings that he's put in the tabernacle. And by following the clues God has left, the gate, the altar, the laver, the lampstand, the table, the golden altar, the veil, the ark, and the mercy seat, while we follow these crumbs all the way through, we end up into his presence. And each article of furniture are principles for finding and facilitating the presence of God in our lives. The revelation of the tabernacle is a road map to God. He has pursued us, desired fellowship with us, and in Christ, the torn veil, he has left an open door. He calls to us. He desires we move into his presence. And so we see here setting up the tabernacle, the ark, in the third verse of uh, the 40th chapter, uh, and thou shalt put therein the ark of the testimony and cover the ark with the veil. What things were uh, commanded first among all instruments to build the Ark of the Covenant? Things placed inside were the tablets of law, Aaron's rod, and the golden jar with manna. It was called many things, the Ark, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, the Ark of the Lord, Holy Ark, the Ark of His strength, and the strength of His glory. 
Here is a picture of the mercy seat, the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, we also see the setting up of the tabernacle, the table and the candlestick. In uh, the fourth verse, uh, it says, And thou shalt bring in the table, and set in order the things that are to be set in order upon it. And thou shalt bring in the candlestick, and light the lamps thereof. Um, we see here first the Ark of the Covenant in the Most Holy Place. Then you see the Altar of Incense, uh, the Table of Showbread, and the Golden Lampstand. And then all the way out you see the bronze laver, the golden, uh, or the altar of the burnt offerings in this outer courtyard. And so, uh, again, you can see north, south, east, and west here, and how it was laid out. You say, what in the world makes this so critical? It is critical because it leaves us to understand uh, the type and the shadows in the Old Testament help us to understand uh, things a lot better uh, in the New Testament. Um, and so the Old Testament is such a strong foundation for us. If you look at this picture quickly, the tabernacle components, you will see the candlestick, the altar of incense, uh, the brazen laver, uh, you will see the courtyard coverings or the fence as they called it, the table of showbread, the covering of skins, the Ark of the Covenant, and you can see how it was, how it was all laid out. And then the, uh, the altar of incense here, it shows really uh, these verses are pointing us to the power of prayer. It says in the fifth verse, And thou shalt set the altar of gold for the incense before the ark of the testimony, and put the hanging of the door to the tabernacle, uh, the brass altar. And thou shalt set the altar of the burnt offering before the door of the tabernacle of the tent of the congregation. And thou shalt set the laver between the tent of the congregation and the altar and shall put water therein in verse 7. So the brazen altar is cleansing, cleansing by the blood, and then you have the laver cleaning by water and these two, the brazen altar and the brazen laver meet at the cross. In 1 John 5 and 6 it says this is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ not by water only but by water and blood. Uh, we know in 1 John 1 and 7 that blood cleanses us from sin. Titus 3 and 5, water cleanses us from defilement. And so this washing at the laver is regeneration. This is not the water baptism, um, but this is done, let a man examine himself. And so as they entered in with their sacrifice into the outer court, they were to go by this uh, laver and reflect and cleanse themselves. Uh, in the court, it says, And thou shalt set up the court round about and hang up the hanging at the court gate. And so we can see here the uh, coverings of curtains that were round about, uh, the things that were inside, and then we see the wall uh, and the gate that they entered into. And thou shalt take the anointing oil and anoint the tabernacle and all that is therein, and shalt hallow, hallow it, and all the vessels thereof, and it shall be holy. Exodus 4 and 9. And so he was anointing it all. Um, and next we see the anointing of the high priest and his sons. In uh, the twelfth verse it says, And thou shalt bring Aaron and his sons unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and wash them with water. And thou shalt put upon Aaron the holy garments. See, here we're talking about the clothing of the high priest. Uh, put upon Aaron the holy garments and anoint him and sanctify him that he may minister unto me in the priest office. In verse 13 and in 14 he says, And thou shalt bring his sons and clothe them with coats. And in verse 15, And thou shalt anoint them as thou didst anoint their father, that they may minister unto me in the priest office. For their anointing shall surely be an everlasting priesthood throughout their generations. Thus did Moses according to all that the Lord commanded him, so did he. And Moses reared up the tabernacle and fastened his sockets and set up the boards thereof and put in the bars thereof and reared up his pillows. Verses 16 to 18. 
And so then we see the fire and the glory. Uh, verse 34, Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And in verse 35, And Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation, because the cloud abode thereon, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And when the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the children of Israel went onward in all their journeys. But if the cloud were not taken up, then they journeyed not till the day that it was taken up. In verse 37 and in 38, For the cloud of the Lord was upon the tabernacle by day, and fire was on it by night, in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all of their journeys. We see here the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night showing their dependence upon God and also the faithfulness of God to his children. And so we see the fire and the glory. So now let's see that same narrative, the perspective from Leviticus, but in a different detail. He gives a little more precise timeline here in Leviticus 8 and 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take Aaron and his sons with him, and the garments, and the anointing oil, and a bullock for the sin offering, and two rants, and a basket of unleavened bread. And gather thou all the congregation together unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Moses brought Aaron and his sons, and washed them with water. And uh, verse 6. And then in Leviticus uh, verses 7 through 9, there's a detailed co clothing of Aaron in the garments of the high priest. So just as we saw in the Exodus narrative, after the clothing of Aaron, there's anointing ceremony. We also see that here in Leviticus. Uh, I don't know how well you can see that online, but the high priest's golden garments here, we've studied this previously. We understood the linen turban, the plate of pure gold, the ephod shoulder straps that held the stones in place, the breastplate of judgment, uh, the stones of memorial, the ephod, the robe of the ephod, the four rows of stones and settings of gold, the chains of gold, embroidered sash, um, and then everybody that was here during our previous study uh, understands and remembers how excited I got the night that I, I was teaching on the pomegranates and the gold bells. But this would be a picture of the fruit and the joyful bells as the priest moved about. The perspective from Leviticus and Moses took the anointing oil and anointed the tabernacle and all that was therein and sanctified them uh, in Leviticus 8 and 10. And he sprinkled thereof upon the altar seven times and anointed the altar and all his vessels, both the laver and his foot, to sanctify them. And he poured of the anointing oil upon Aaron's head and anointed him to sanctify him. Now we will see as we saw in Exodus the clothing and anointing of the sons of Aaron. In uh, verse 13, And Moses brought Aaron's sons and put coats upon them and girded them with girdles and put bonnets upon them as the Lord commanded Moses. What follows is a narrative describing sacrifices offered by Moses. With this, Moses will sanctify the altar and sprinkle blood on Aaron. Next, we have a time clue that we did not have earlier. Uh, Therefore shall ye abide at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation day and night seven days and keep the charge of the Lord that ye die not. For so I am commanded. Aaron cannot leave the door of the tabernacle for seven days. If he does he will die. This is a command not optional and it includes not only Aaron but also his sons. And in verse 36 so Aaron and his son did all things which the Lord commanded by the hand of Moses. And it came to pass on the eighth day that Moses called Aaron and his sons and the elders of Israel. So let's mark this. Seven days of consecration and waiting have now passed. It is now the eighth day. 
So let's see what happens. We'll note that for the first time er ever, Aaron is offering sacrifices for the people. So we find here in Leviticus, the ninth chapter, and verse 1, the priest ministry begins. We see here the beginning of the priestly ministry. And the first part of that is the sin offering. And he brought the people's offering and took the goat, which was the sin offering, for the people and slew it and offered it for sin as the first. And then we see the burnt offering. And he brought the burnt offering, offered it according to the manner in Leviticus 9 and 16. And then here in 9, 17, the meat offering. And he brought the meat offering and took a handful thereof and burnt it upon the altar beside the burnt sacrifice of the morning. And then the peace offering. Lastly here, we see he slew also the bullock and the ram for a sacrifice of peace offerings which was for the people. And Aaron's sons presented unto him the blood, which he sprinkled upon the altar round about. So here is the full cycle of sacrifices minus the trespass offering. Here we have the death of sin in the sin offering, the death of self in the burnt offering, and the death of division and strife in the peace offering. Blessing the people with the fire and glory. In Leviticus 9 and 22, And Aaron lifted up his hand toward the people and blessed them, and came down from offering of the sin offering and the burnt offering and the peace offerings. So after the cycle of offerings is completed, the high priest begins to bless the people. And this is their first high priestly blessing. And in chapter 9 and verse 23, And Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle, tabernacle of the congregation and came out and blessed the people and the glory of the Lord appeared unto all the people. And now both, both Moses and Aaron are blessing the people and something else begins to happen. Remember now they've gone through all of these offerings. Something else begins to happen. The glory of God appears. In verse 24, And there came a fire out from before the Lord and consumed upon the altar the burnt offering and the fat, which when all the people saw, they shouted and fell on their faces. Then the fire of God fell on the altar, consuming the sacrifice. Blessings, glory, fire, all of this was connected to the installation of Aaron as the new high priest. Now remember what we're studying. We're talking about the uh, the high priest. Aaron is only a type. We're looking beyond Aaron. Aaron is only a type of the high priest to come, Jesus. He served in the tabernacle of Moses, which was only a copy of the perfect tabernacle to come. The order of revelation is first the natural and then the spiritual. The natural priestly minister of Aaron is to point to the spiritual priestly ministry of Jesus. The natural tabernacle was to reveal the spiritual tabernacle. The old covenant pointed to the new and required it for ratification. And so we understand the importance of the tabernacle and the furnishings in the tabernacle and the clothing that the priest wore and the things that the priest were required to do and their commitment to their calling and to their office. There's an old adage that says the New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed and the old is in the new revealed. And we miss a dimension of revelation by ignoring the Old Testament. It gives us a depth perception. It adds rich imagery to our understanding. It was the New Testament Bible in the apostolic era. How did they consistently preach New Testament truth from the old? They read it in a way that we're familiar, unfamiliar with today. In Hebrews 8 and 1 it says, We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. 
This is the point Peter's making. Jesus is seated in heaven's tabernacle. No high priest had ever gone into the sanctuary to stay. He was only allowed to visit. None had ever dared to attempt to be seated on the mercy seat. But Jesus, the writer declares, has done so. Jesus sitteth at the right hand of God. I don't know about you, but that excites me. We've got a Father that understands what we're going through. He understands our pains, our frustrations, and He looks at us and understands why. Because He was man, but He was God. He came and He uh, paid the price for you and I so that we might be free. And so Peter is trying to make a point to us to look at Jesus. He is not just visiting heaven. He's seated at the right hand in a spot or a place of authority. And he's there representing or interceding for you and I. No matter what you're going through today, no matter how difficult our situation is, I'll tell you if we'll do like Mary and break open the that costly perfume and pay the price of commitment and get down on our knees before Almighty God. He will open up doors of which we know not. This same Jesus is touched by our infirmities and we can put our trust in an awesome God. Amen. Let's bow our heads for a closing prayer. Father, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for your promise that you will see us through every situation of our life. We place our confidence and our trust in you, and we ask that you will be with the members and friends of this congregation. And God, I ask that you make us stronger through this journey. Lord, help us to keep our eyes on the prize, and that we put our trust and our confidence completely in you, understanding and knowing and exercising our faith that that nothing shall defeat us, nothing shall harm us, but that we are servants of a living God and we trust you with everything that is within us. Bless your holy name, we pray. Amen and amen.